Welcome everyone, happy Thursday. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to uh, join this webinar. Today, we're gonna be talking about the 10 steps to a successful real estate investing partnership. It is top of the hour and I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So let's go ahead and get started. I am Renika Lightborn with Advanta IRA and I'm delighted to be joined by our featured speaker, Mr. Farley Yeoman. He's the president of Top Option Capital. Uh, welcome Farley, thank you so much for being our speaker today. Thank you, Renika, for having me today. Oh, you're certainly welcome. Um, so Farley's going to cover some of the benefits of partnerships, some of the potential drawbacks that you need to be um, mindful of in terms of, you know, the wrong partnership and then how to choose the best uh, investing partner for you. Uh, before I turn it over, I do want to give you just a general overview of what self-direction is and how it works. If you have questions, uh, feel free to put those in the question box. We'll allocate some time at the very end to get those answered for you. Again, I'm Renika Lightborn. I'm one of the business development specialists here at Advanta. I've been with Advanta as a client, um, as an employee since 2019, but I'm also an Advanta IRA client prior to joining. So self-direction is something that I actively do. Um, I've partnered on real estate transactions um, with individuals um, in the past. So definitely, you know, just understanding the importance of uh, the right partnerships is very important. If you have questions or you want to talk more about your specific um, self-directed IRA goals, uh, definitely feel free to uh, send me an email or um, you know give me a call. Or you're most certainly welcome to visit our website at advantaira.com to schedule a consultation. Just a little disclaimer before we get started: at Advanta IRA, we don't give any tax, legal, or investment advice. All of the information that's going to be presented today is just for educational purposes. So as always, uh, we encourage you to do your due diligence, um, consult with your professional team, obviously do your due diligence on any partnerships you're, you're seeking to um, be a part of. Just a quick takeaway, if self-direction is a new concept for you, just know that any IRA or former employer plan, uh, whether it's an old 401k or 403b, uh, can be self-directed. Uh, the important thing is with self-direction, you're in control, so you get to choose what is it that you want to invest in. Today, we're focusing more so on uh, real estate-related investment opportunities or partnerships. And then, of course, um, all of the expenses, this, all of the income generated from that investment flows back into the IRA. And if there's any related expenses, it's paid out of the IRA. So just a little history about Advanta and who we are. Uh, we've been in business for 21 plus years now as the leading self-directed IRA administrator in business in the industry. Um, our headquarters is located in Largo, Florida. Advanta also has an office in Atlanta, which is where I'm based. Um, but we do work with clients nationwide. Uh, currently, we have uh, well over $2.7 billion under our administration. But Advanta, in addition to providing you the concierge-style service for our clients, we do have um, guest speakers and experts like Farley come in to knowledge share with our, you know, our audience, our listeners about uh, the different opportunities that you can do within a self-directed account. Um, this webinar is recorded, is going to be uploaded into our YouTube channel um, pretty quickly within 24 to 48 business hours. Uh, you're also, again, welcome to uh, go to our website, check out our video library. I would encourage you to check out our blog. Also, my colleague, um, Alex Perini, does a, a really good um, podcast relating to um, anything and everything self-direction. So very simply, um, what is a self-directed IRA? It just means that you, as the account owner, you're going to have complete control over the retirement funds. You have complete control over the investment decision. It really allows you to diversify outside of the traditional stocks and bonds. Uh, most of our clients have real estate related holdings, you know, whether it's a single family or rental property, um, but you can certainly use IRA funds to invest in private equities, uh, precious metals, oil and gas. Uh, the list goes on and on in terms of what's on the table for you. Why do people choose to self-direct? Uh, you can self-direct for many different reasons. I'll just touch on three of them. One, so it's it's a new source of capital for you, especially um, you know instead of you know taking out a you know a loan or tapping into your emergency fund, uh, you can certainly just look to uh, transfer funds from an existing IRA, or you can roll over from uh, a former employer plan and kind of pool your funds together to uh, to do that partnership deal or do that next investment inside of your IRA. Another reason as to why people choose to self-direct is because of the, um, you know, the stock market, the ups and downs, the volatility in the stock market. Uh, with real estate, we know it's a tangible asset. It's always going to retain value. People are always going to need a place to live. So if your IRA you know, owns a rental property or it does a flip, 
then of course it allows you to, again, diversify. And then of course the tax benefits, having those rents, those profits, those dividends flow back into your retirement account, tax free or tax deferred. In terms of the different types of accounts that can be self-directed, it's the ones that you are already familiar with. Uh, for individuals, uh, there is pre-tax accounts like traditional IRA, or you can do a Roth IRA, um, which is post-tax dollars. So th the main thing is with the Roth IRA, you elect to pay the taxes up front, you grow that account over time, you've held that Roth IRA for five years. Once you reach retirement age of 59 and a half, the distributions will be tax-free. If you are self-employed or you have a side business, I know a lot of real estate professionals um, like to uh, self-direct an individual 401k. You have higher contribution limits, you have greater flexibility. So definitely, uh, if that's of interest to you, then feel free to reach out to me. Some smaller or less known accounts that can also be self-directed, but this is important. If you have kids, you can self-direct an ESA, an educational savings account, uh, to cover their educational related expenses. And then of course, um, if you have a high deductible health insurance plan, uh, you're eligible to uh, self-direct your HSA and invest in, in real estate or tax liens or you know, partner together using that account. And then of course, any former employer plan, meaning again, old 401k, 403b, TSB, 457, any former employer plan can be self-directed. The only thing to keep in mind, if it's a current employer plan and you're not yet 59 and a half, which is the retirement age, most times they will restrict you from moving it. So you have to check with your current employer to see, to see if they'll make an exception. But if it's a former employer plan, you can move it at will. Um, in addition to, there's a couple ways you can fund your account. You can transfer from an existing IRA or you can do a, a direct rollover from an old employer plan. If it's an existing IRA, Advanta as the receiving custodian will work with you and work with the other custodian to get those funds moved over. If it's a former employer plan, you would actually have to initiate that request, reaching out to that old employer plan to tell them you want to move X amount of dollars over to another qualified retirement account. We'll provide you the information, we'll guide you through it, um, but you ultimately have to um, initiate that. The other way you can fund your account is by making an annual cash contribution. As long as you have earned income, you'd be eligible to, uh, to contribute. I know for um, uh, we're obviously in the tax season, uh, tax deadline to make a contribution for 2023, if you've not yet uh, done so, is um, April, Monday, April 15. So if you've not yet, you still have some time. Um, for 2024, you have up until tax filing deadline next year to make your contribution. For, 2024, for 2023, if you're under the age of 50, for traditional or Roth IRA, you can put in uh, 6,500. If you're over the age of 50, then you can put, um, put in 7,500. For 2024, you get an additional $1,000 uh, increase. So uh, 7,000 for traditional or Roth under 50 or 8,000 if you're over 50. Uh, for a solo 401k, essentially you get to contribute twice, once as an employee, and then you get to match as the employer. So when you combine the two, that gives you the higher contribution limits. Uh, for 2024, uh, you can put in 69,000. Again, a lot of real estate professionals prefer, if you're eligible for 401k, like it because you have the higher uh, contribution limits. For ESAs, you can put in 2,000 per year per child. And then for an HSA uh, for 2024, as long as you have a high deductible plan for an individual, you can put in 4150 or 8300 as a family uh, HSA plan. If you're over the age of 55, um, keep in mind with an HSA, you actually have the ability to put in an additional $1,000. When you're ready to get started with us, the process is actually streamlined for you. It's three simple steps. Step one, uh, you complete our application. Uh, you can do it directly on our website at advantaira.com, or you can reach out to myself or one of my colleagues, and we'll be able to walk you through it. Again, we get your account open pretty quickly, uh, typically within 24 to 48 business hours. You will have an assigned account manager, someone who's going to be with you for the life of your account um, when you're doing the transactions. And then, of course, um, the next step is funding the account, whether that's doing a combination of you know, making an annual cash contribution as long as you have earned income or you're transferring from an existing IRA or you're doing a direct rollover from an old employer plan. And then finally, uh, step three is, you know, start investing. What is it that you have an interest in? Is it, you know, partnering on a, a real estate related, um, you know, fix and flip project or a uh, rental property? Uh, you have uh, near limitless um, opportunities. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and 
switch it over to um, to Farley to make him the presenter. Farley, you can go ahead and unmute and. Appreciate those tips. Um, I'm definitely a firm believer in the Roth IRA, mainly because it's tax free, you know, as it grows and when you take it out. So appreciate the tips on that. I'm sure the audience did. So we'll go ahead and get started on the 10 steps of a great real estate partnership. And so um, first, let's, let's kind of, a lot of people think of a partnership for fix and flips, which is one option or holding a rental. You know, a partnership could be almost anything in real estate. It could be, um, you know, I have people that call me. They're not really comfortable with going to houses and negotiating a contract, but they might be good at finding uh, that property to begin with. So sometimes I will go out with that person. They they want to learn the negotiation. We're going to partner up. Um, you know, that person can make money by finding the property and I'll make money for negotiating it. And so that would be uh, a partnership right there. I just feel like the advantages of a partnership are, are definitely beneficial. I've, I've actually never done a deal by myself, always partner up with somebody else. The old saying that two two brains is better than one, I believe is correct. And you know, you just have different skills. The other reasons that it would be advantageous to partner up is you know the money maybe you don't have quite enough money to get to the closing table by yourself but you would be able to partner up with somebody and then um you don't need quite as much cash and that would be a big plus as well definitely if it's your first deal um i do not suggest ever putting all your cash in on the very first deal um, when i train people I always say you know the more money you put out the more risk and that's just logical. So the, the the less you put in on the very first deal, I would say the better. And so those are the advantages, I believe, um, with the partnership. Um, two, you could have two partners, three partners, probably wouldn't go past that. Um, you know, it'd be too many people, but two or three partners would, would definitely be great. And, you know, a lot of people, I, I think they don't go into real estate because because of fear. They're not really sure whether they're going to succeed or not. They don't. They don't feel very comfortable. And you know, I've seen people wait five years to get into real estate. That's way too long. You know, get with somebody that you feel comfortable with, partner up with them, figure out a way where you can both make some money. And then, you know, the other thing, of course, if you don't start doing it, you can't learn it as well. And then, of course, your experience level. When we set up loans, sometimes we will ask you for your experience level and that will affect your interest rate for the loan um, when I set up loans. So go ahead and get the experience, get on a, get on an operating agreement, get with somebody that knows what they're doing and move forward. You know, fear is what stops a lot of people, but you won't have as much fear if you partner up with somebody that has experience. Now, how to, uh, obviously you got to find out how you're going to find a partner. So, you know, you, I, I really think you've got to bring some skills. I mean, what what if I told you, you know, I have um, no experience, my credit score is low, I can't renovate anything on the house, and I absolutely have no money. Do you want to partner up with me? No, I do not want to partner up with you. So you have to at least acquire some, some kind of skills. That could be anything. You could... Um, be good at finding, you know, abandoned houses, skip trace those, bring those to your partner, maybe start to learn the numbers and and try to figure out, you know, a good deal. I mean, if, especially if you sign it up or even if you, um, you know, refer that house to um, somebody that can get it signed up on, and put it under contract, that's, that's a skill. And you just, you know, you're going to be part of the team. So you you know maybe you um, you don't know how to renovate at all, but maybe you could learn how to do wood floors. You're going to be doing that part or something on the house to help with the renovation. So just acquire some kind of skill. Obviously, you know I know people that are great at renovations. Um, they can renovate virtually any part of the house. They know how to put the crews together, and that's a plus. Um, I know. I always tell people I've read 60 books on real estate investing. Some of it was tips, some of it was stories. So one story said the renovator, you know, he, he didn't have any money. Um, 
He was ready to work hard, though, and definitely could do most parts of the house on the renovation. He asked 16 people to partner up with him. Number 14 partnered up with him. So, you know, he didn't quit after asking 10 people. 10 people told him, no, you have to have some perseverance in this industry of real estate. And he did. And he partnered up and they made plenty of money. So, and his partner gave, you know, put up all the cash to set up the loan and, and the other costs. So, very, very important to reach out, go to the meetings. I know Renika and I go to a lot of meetings. It's, it's really beneficial to step, to step out and get out to the meetings. Farley, if I can interject really quick, I do have the references to make sure the audience know. If you're using your IRA, unfortunately, you can't do any of the sweat equity um, on a renovation. You would have to hire it out to a, a third party or someone who's not disqualified um, from you. So just as an FYI, you can't do any of the, the physical labor on the property that your IRA is involved in. You can oversee the project. Yeah. You can decide what needs to get done, but you can't personally do the, uh, the sweat equity. All right, so that's what, that's if you're pulling the money out of the IRA, you're saying. But if it's uh, if you're not pulling under the IRA, I guess you could do it. But yeah, that's a good point. So appreciate you stepping in on that. So the third one is how to best um, set up the agreement in regard to duties for each partner. This is very important. A lot of people just verbally, you know, Renika says she's going to find the property and negotiate it. I'm going to put up the cash. She put in one third of cash. Whatever our agreement is. You know, verbally, it's fine to talk verbally, but um, I would not do just a verbal agreement. I, I repeat, I would not do just a verbal agreement. At least email each other. Like I know with my partners, you know, we meet first in person. We go, I take notes. Um, Renika is going to do this as a partner. I'm going to do this. And I type it all up and I send it to her. And then she says, yep, yeah, that's what we agreed to. At least the email, maybe even a formal agreement where we both sign on it. The reason why I say this is, you know, some people verbally will come back later and say, well, I didn't say I was, I was going to, um, you know, do, do all the estimates and get all the renovators in there and put the crews together. I thought you were going to do half of it. Everything's in the email. You know, if you say that you didn't agree to it, it's right there in writing that you did agree to it. So, you know, very important that both people step forward to do what they say they're going to do and give the full effort. And some partners will not. If you don't, then, of course, that person will not partner up with you again because you didn't even do what you said you were going to do on the list as a partner. So very important to write it up and, and um, maybe even get a formal agreement where you both sign on it. The fourth one is should a lawyer write up an agreement for the partners? Probably a lawyer should write it up um, for one reason, and, and this comes from one of my clients down in Tampa. You know, her and her partner figured, you know, what what if something happened? Somebody got injured and couldn't do the duties. What if the, one of the you know, we don't want to think about these things, but what if one person passed away? What would happen at that point? You know, how would the agreement alter? What would you do? Um, you know, so a lawyer, you know, and you never know. You're hoping that nothing would ever have to go to court later. But if for some reason something did, if you did have a huge disagreement and you had to go to court, then of course the lawyer paperwork would, would probably uh, put you in a better position. So it's just more for clarity. So that would be number four. And I want to spend a lot of time on number five. I think the percentage of profit can really, really vary depending on, you know, how you want to put it together. Um, obviously, you know, the main thing is to figure first is how much experience do you have? If you have no experience, like when I started fixing and flipping and my first one was in Austell, Georgia, um, you know, I didn't really care how much money I made in all honesty. I, I just thought to myself, I want to make some money because I, I am working and I'm sweating at the property, but I, you know, I mainly want to learn and I partnered up with a person that not only had done a lot of fix and flips and made money every time, he even sold a restaurant. So, you know, I partnered up with him. I only got 20%. That's all I wanted. But I didn't put any money into the deal. So my cash on cash return was much, much higher than his. And that's how I went into it. Um, if you think you're going to get, you know, your very first deal, you're going to get 70, 80%. You have no experience. 
Um, you know, I mean, you can set it up whatever way you want with your partners, as long as both of you agree to it. But if you get too greedy, then of course, nobody will probably want to partner up with you. The main thing on the first deal of partnership, or of course, you being, if you're, especially if you're new and your partner, if they have experience, either way, your main goal on the first deal should be to succeed and not have failure. So I don't have any exact stats on this. I, I study a lot of the stats and data. Um, I haven't been able to find anything on this, but I would say the majority of people that lose money on their very first real estate deal never go back into real estate. And, you know, that's a shame because 90% of millionaires come out of real estate. Um, you're going to say it's, it's a bad industry because you lost money on the very first deal. It's not a bad industry. It's just that you either went into it by yourself with no experience or you partnered up with somebody that had almost no experience. Now, I'm not saying you can't succeed on your first deal with no experience. Um, I just don't like to put – when I train people, I just tell them, look, I don't want to put you in the position to maybe make money. I want to make sure that you're going to make money. And then also there's going to be a backup plan. Maybe if you can't sell the house as a flip, you can hold it as a rental or rent to own. That would be a good backup plan. And so you're pretty much in the driver's seat. One of those two is going to work. And so that's, um, you know, that's how I, I figure people should go into the percentages. Percentages really just really can vary. I mean, um, you know, if you if you're going to put in all the money, and you have no experience. I don't know. There's there's some people in Atlanta that have a lot of experience, and they'll do. They're going to get fifty percent. You're going to get fifty. Um, if it was me, I would probably ask less than fifty, simply because you know you're putting all the money in, and I'm not putting any money in, and and I just try not to be greedy. I figure, you know, it it really depends on the situation. One 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 way of thinking about money and going to the loan table is, you know, it is one thing for me to have money and I can put it forward on the deal along with you. And it's another thing when I don't, if I don't have money. If I don't have money, that means I can't do the deal without you. So cash is king. Um, you know, if you have all the money, then an the other person, especially if they don't have experience, they're not, they're not going to be, uh, you know, they're only going to be doing certain things. Um, you know, maybe they're going to put the, the crews together and whatnot, and they're going to be at the property more. It just depends on the duty list, but definitely cash is, is about, the, you know, especially if, if one person's putting in all the cash, that's, that's the first thing you're going to need to look at. And there's really no, 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 you know, definite way to do the percentages. Just uh, try to think through it. All right. So that for number six. Farley, if I can interject uh, before you go into number six, just really sure. quick. Um, from an IRA perspective, there's a couple ways you can partner. Um, so like if you're, you know, a limited partner on a syndication, obviously the provider have their requirements for you as an investor. Um, but if you're just doing a general partnership or if your IRA is putting in 100 percent of the money, and typically in that scenario, again, based on how it's structured, the IRA would typically get back 100 percent of the profit. So it just really depends on how the deal is structured. You can um, partner together using an LLC um, feature uh, within the IRA, meaning your IRA own maybe 25 percent of an LLC. And then you have other partners that owns, you know, the remaining 75 percent. And then your IRA put an X amount of dollars, 25% um, of the money in that LLC, and that LLC then goes out and purchases real estate. So there's different ways you can structure it, but just keep in mind, whatever the IRA puts in, it needs to get back um, and also be responsible for its share of the expenses. With that, you can go ahead, um, Farley. So number six, how to scale up with the same partner for future deals. So what I would say, if you're partnering up with somebody, you know, Let's just make, if Ronique and I partnered up to do a fix and flip, let's say in Stone Mountain, um, you know, let's just make sure we can make money on deal one and let's see how much money do we make. Are we going to make 50000 and 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 split it up or are we going to make 100000 You know, what, what do we do on the first deal? Then after I would say two or three successes and, and see how much we're, we're making and also just checking to see, I mean, if, if Ronique is doing everything she said, I'm doing everything I said then we have a great partnership and we will continue forward. Now we've only been doing one a day. 
I always say, or one, one, you know, one, one every few months would say, and, you know, they always say on Shark Tank, they always talk about scaling up. Well, with real estate, you know, what if, what if, what if, um, Renika and I started doing two at a time? So we scaled up to two, we're making even more money. Um, and then we get up to three. And, you know, there are partnerships I see quite often where they're, they're rotating three properties. They have one that is maybe almost completely renovated about the sale. They've got another one that just started renovating and they just put a third one up under contract. Just, you know, it can, it can vary on the timeline. And, you know, there's partners that will do three properties at a time. Once you get past that, you're probably going to need a bigger team of, of partners or if not a partner, maybe an assistant that gets paid, you know, separate from the, the profit percentage. But that's how you scale up. What is a lot of money on a flip? Just real quick, I would say, you know, when you get to around 100000 total profit on one property flip, that puts you in the big leagues. A lot of people only make thirty or forty thousand. Um, I do know somebody um, in another state in the southeast. It makes about thirty-five thousand per flip, but the lady's done ten of them, so three hundred fifty thousand a year. So it just depends on what your angle is. I don't particularly like that angle because if there's any surprise expense, the thirty-five just went down to maybe ten thousand profit. But that that market there, that that particular investor can always rent out the house um, if they can't sell it for a, a, a solid profit. So just there's different angles in real estate. Um, you just have to figure out along with your partner which which angle to go. All right, number seven, how to start off as partners and then terminate possibly that agreement or alter that agreement. And and so the reason why I bring this up, and this was actually in 2011, I did the flip I was talking about in Austin. My partner and I, partner lives about 10 minutes from me. You know, I met him at work originally, and we partnered up. And at that time, I didn't have much experience, and I figured he did, and we we went into it together. Now, what he wanted to do really was keep the house as a rental. Um, the reason why I did not want to keep it as a rental is I wanted to go ahead and, and make my money on the flip. Um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I was paying my bills and my mortgage, and that's how I went into it. At that time, I did not have the knowledge that I have now to be a little bit more creative. So what, what we could have done, uh, let's see, we'll go through the percentages. So on on that particular deal, I made 20%, and but I didn't put any money into it at all. Um, the second deal I did with him, I did um, put in 5000 and I got up to 35%. Um, definitely not a lot, of, a lot of percentage, but like I said, first couple of deals, just trying to you know make sure that I learned and made some money. So what we could have done, because he really did want to hold it as a rental, we could have made it where – um, instead of him giving me 20%, he could have given me, let's say, 30%, and then the agreement could have been terminated, and he could have just kept it as a rental as, a, as a, you know, for his own. That would have been one option. Another option could have been, you know, still keep me at 20%. And, and now when we say 20%, we, we, we're going to have to project because if we're not going to sell the house, then, of course, we would project what we would have made on it beforehand and 20% of that I would have, I would have received when, when all the renovations were done. And, and then at that point, uh, we would have uh, gone to the, the rental and we would have either split that halfway, you know, he's still putting all, let's say he's putting in all the money, any kind of uh, HVAC system goes out or something, he's got to pay for it. Um, maybe I would only get, you know, 40%, 30 or 40 to find new renters, maintain the place, collect the rent, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that partnership, basically, I called myself the time man, and he was the money man. And believe it or not, in Austell, you could, uh, you know, and by the way, in 2011, and I just, I know, having to, been to meetings for the last 18 years in Atlanta, 
and now I'm going to Florida and Tennessee the last two years. Um, I see some positive people at the meetings and I see some negative people and the people that are negative, you know, they're going to say things like this is a bad time for real estate. Uh, the loans are, are picking up more this year in my industry when I set them up than last year. So I don't, I don't know where they're getting their information. Atlanta is just booming. We have the world cup coming up, et cetera, et cetera. There's a shortage. As long as there's a shortage, um, you know, real estate's going to be strong. So. In any case, um, the negativity in 2011 was, was rampant. Uh, 2011 is only 13 years ago, totally different market. Literally bunches of houses empty, abandoned. The one we took over in Austell had been sitting there three years. You're not even going to see a house sit for three months now, probably. So, you know, just, just totally different market. People told me uh, it's, a, it's the worst time that you could go into a fix and flip. The worst time. Don't do it, Farley. Don't do it. Did it anyway. The key, of course, is negotiating the price, uh, the front end price. That would be true at, at all times, but even more true in a down market. So that particular house in uh, Austell was listed for $75,000. Um, I don't know how the agent figured this. I, I started ask. I just asked her, I mean, what, do you, what do you think it was a short sale? What do you think the bank will take? She said, oh, they'll probably take $45,000. So that's what I put in. And so we, we made money on that flip. And, you know, during a time that a lot of people not only sold the house in like four months after we renovated it, for a total of four months, we, uh, we sold it in cash. But the price, 45 to buy, 10 to renovate, sold for 95 Just drove by the house last week coming back from work and saw that it was listed. So I looked it up. It had not been for sale. It would still have the same color that we painted the house. And that particular house is now listed for 300000 So think about it, guys. If if we had not been able to sell it, that probably would have been our best day. We would have switched to a rental. We only put in, you know, way less than 100000 and would have sold it for three hundred now. Partner bought the house in cash. So the, the right houses, as long as you have a backup plan, the, the, the houses that are rough to have a backup plan are the million-dollar ones. Because they're very hard to switch to a rental and see good numbers. So just something to think about. Um, but we, you know, there's all kind of variations from, from what I just said as to how him and myself could have set up the agreement to keep it as a rental. There's all kind of variations in the percentages or timeline. You know, just be creative. It's really about what you and your partner want, and there's all kind of ways you could set it up. All right, I put number eight, how to avoid getting the wrong person as a partner, and I put this as number eight on purpose out of the ten. The eight ball in pool, if you hit it into the into the hole, you just lost the game. Okay, so no matter how good you are with your knowledge of fix and flips, rentals, whatever, you get the wrong partner, you, you, you could go right down the drain. So I would say, you know, obviously people like Renika that have a, a huge network in Atlanta, you know, if she referred me somebody, I would feel more comfortable than just meeting somebody out and about. Um, you know, she can vouch. What if um, maybe Renika's already partnered up with this person, but she's too busy now to do fix and flip. She's going to concentrate on the Vanta. And she refers me to this person, but she's already worked with him for five years. I'm, I'm going to go by that. I would never go by the internet, five stars, whatever. I'm not going to go by that. I, I like to meet people eyeball to eyeball like Renika, and she just tells me flat out. Now, I, you know, I always say when you recommend somebody, always, of course, say, you know, that's my recommendation, but you got to do your own research on the person because that could backfire if you recommend somebody and they end up not being good. Um, I'm, I'm not responsible for anybody that I refer, is what I always say. You've got to do your own research on the person and get comfortable with them. So I would, you know, at least get to know them a little bit, get references, meet in person, of course, maybe more than once. Um, maybe it's somebody you've known for a while. And then another option, this is really for both partners, is you could get a, a mentee to start off with you, not not as a partner, a profitable partner, 
they would get paid by the hour of the job. What do you, what do you do in during that time? Well, that person is making a little bit of money, getting experience, so that's a plus. But what you're doing is you're, is you're watching how they work. Do they really get there early in the day and, and work hard to get the house, you know, ready to, to sell? Or are they, you know, showing up at the halfway mark of the day? Um, or are they following through with what they say they're going to do? If they do work hard and follow through, then they could be your, your future profitable partner. You'll switch them from a per hour or per job payment to a profitable partner. So that would be another way for both of you kind of to gradually um, build into a partnership. All right. How do you find new partners is number nine, if you wish to scale up even more. I mean, obviously, it's all about confidence. Um, you know, could you convince someone to be a partner better if you had zero flips under your belt or one, or if you had five? Of course, it would be five. I, the lady that I set up three loans with in Tampa last year, you know, when she first started off, nobody wanted to partner up with her, but she went ahead and did it. She did. And we're talking about the great thing about real estate, of course, she gets started at any age. She started at 55, 55 to 60. About that during that time, she did five flips. She made between fifty and one hundred ninety thousand on all five flips. So the same lady that she had been friends with um, since way back in elementary school that did not want to partner up with her, all of a sudden said, "Can we have coffee?" And of course, what that meant is she wanted to partner up with her. But she didn't want to partner up with her at first, even though they were great friends. She wanted to partner up with her after she saw her succeed with five and a profit every single time. And, you know, when I do fix and flips, I've, I've never, ever lost money. I'm going to be doing another fix and flip here in the spring with a couple partners. I'll be looking for more partners to, to partner up with for flips, and especially ones that don't, you know, they're new, a little bit newer to fix and flips. Um, you know, I was a college teacher for 11 years. I was teaching way before I went into real estate. So, you know, I would like to definitely train somebody. Um, either on fix and flips, wholesaling, whatever, as a partner, as a, as a mentor. So there's always people out there you can partner up with. It just obviously you're going to get more traction if you have some kind of experience or some kind of skill set. And maybe, you, maybe you're a renovator that just knows how to put the crews together and are very fast with the renovations and high quality. That's a plus. I want to partner up with you. So, you know, there's a, a way to build confidence. It's just, you know, it's just logical. There's certain things that you've got to have. You've got to have some kind of skill. Or if you don't have a skill, what if you had a high credit score? So you've got, uh, you've got an 800 credit score. Um, Joe does not, he has actually a very low credit score. So low that we can't even set him up for a loan. Now, a lot of people think when we set up loans, that we won't look at your credit score. That's not true. When when I set up loans, we're looking usually for a minimum of 600. I do have one source that will go into the 500s. But let's just say you're 500 flat. Uh, doubt I can, you know, I'll try, but I doubt I can set you up with a loan. You're going to need somebody with a high credit score. And so that I, 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 I guess you could call that a skill. I mean, a credit score is a, is basically a habit, knowledge, of how to build up your credit. And if you can, if you have a high credit score, then you could bring that forward as, as basically a skill. So there's different ways that you can use what you have, but you have to have something. And now last thing on number nine, you know, some people, they get really good at flipping. They're making a lot of money, but they're really, really not good at persuading people to still go with them. So, you know, anybody can reach out to me. I do have certain ways to make sure that you can, you know, better persuade somebody because some people really just don't, don't know how to, how to do that. Even though they have the experience that they need, they still have trouble finding partners. So there's just a certain way to, to get to that level. All right. And then the last thing, um, should you ever do a deal by yourself without a partner? I would say probably not. I mean, I just think there's so many advantages of a partnership. Uh, I've all my d deals I've done with a partner. Um, I've never lost money on a fix and flip, maybe because I have had a partner. Whatever, whatever the reason is, you know, 
success is success. And then, you know, with a, with a partner, um, they may just see things you don't see and vice versa. And, you know, that's, that's the way to go. But if you do want to go out by yourself, just make sure what I always tell people in the training session, make sure that you have enough cash reserves. One of the top reasons why people fail on fix and flips is okay, the renovation budget is sixty thousand and they find something that's an extra twenty thousand. All right. Um it doesn't really look good when you call back the lender asking for more money. They probably won't give it to you and it just it just doesn't look good. Um so you know if you re- if you really didn't have that extra twenty thousand it's possible that you would have to walk away from the deal and that will be a failure and you will lose all the money that you put at the closing table. You will lose, you know, whatever you put out, it it, it will be gone if you walk away from the deal and give it back to the lender. So only, only go by yourself if you have quite a bit of experience and and quite a lot of cash reserve. But even then I would say it would be better to partner up with somebody. Appreciate everybody's time. And uh, I guess there'll be a few questions, Renika. Yes, thank you so much, Farley, for um, going through the the 10 steps for a great real estate partnership. If you have questions, um, you know, feel free to put those in the question box. We'll now allocate uh, uh, this time to get those answered. Um, So there are are several questions, Um, one of which is if you are, you know, partnering or lending money to, say, a fix and flipper and they're, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days late, how do you deal with that delinquent um, um, partnership? So that would be a partnership like um, I'm going to actually put the the money forward or I'm going to put it out as a loan, I wonder, or she wasn't specific on those two. Yes, as a lender. As a lender. Okay. Um, I mean, really, the you know, when I set up loans, I have a wide variety of lenders that are companies. Some are big, medium, small, and I have some pro- what I call private individuals, individual being the, the key word because a lot of people – use the words private lending and it gets a little vague as to exactly what that is. Basically private lending just means they have access to the money at that company's building. But a real private individual would be like where Nika has a couple hundred thousand and she wants to lend it out. So if it's a private individual, of course, it'll be whatever, whatever you put into the agreement. Um, Normally when, when people are late, um, you know, obviously, almost always the lender is in first position. State of Georgia, we, you know, the lender does have the right to foreclose on you if you're late. So there, there would be we, now if there if you need an extension, maybe you say it was six months or twelve months, and you need an extension, then you know it's, uh, it depends on what's written up in the agreement. But normally they can extend. They may they may add another point, you know, per month. Um, which if it's a big loan, like a million dollar loan, you're talking about 10,000 a, a month on that extra point, plus your, you know, your interest that you're still paying. So, you know, it just depends on how it's set up, but, you know, obviously in the state of Georgia, they, they do have the right to foreclose. So you really need to be on time with your payments. Florida is a judicial state. Um, I've heard of people, you know, skipping their payments for six months, a year or two. And finally, the court figured it out. So Florida is totally different than Georgia. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, what specific verbiage would you recommend um, including in the operating agreement? And then um, the second part of the question is, what documents are needed to do a real estate partnership? Okay. So the operating agreement, of course, we're going to look at, um, you, you set up the percentage. Um, there are some, that's a good question because there are some lenders that will require a certain percentage. So let's say, you know, I don't think Renika would agree to this, but let's say we, we did it anyway. I'm at 90% and Renika's at 10%. There, you know, for, for, for that, uh, some lenders will not want that agreement. They're going to want Renika at least at 20%. And then, you know, it's just a combination of reasons for, experience and showing that, you know, you've got a bigger piece of, of the operating agreement. You want to, you, my, every lender is a little bit different, but I would say the, uh, the minimum a partner should be on there at 20%. The documents, I guess you're talking about paperwork. Again, I would just have one person, you know, meet, like I mentioned earlier, meet together. Um, one of you type up what, what each person said they were going to agree to do. 
So like my two partners coming up, one of them's a renovator. One of them's going to, he's a real estate agent. He's mainly going to find the house and we're, I'm putting in a certain amount of money and, uh, you know, doing certain things like, you know, putting and putting all the budget together, all the paperwork together, et cetera, et cetera. I may find the house as well. You know, if the agent uh, can't find the, the, the one with the right numbers, then I'm, I may find one, you know, that's, you know, driving for dollars basically and find one. So, you know, that's not the extensive list of what each three of us are doing, but uh, I haven't written up those things yet, but I will be. I'm, I'm kind of like the paperwork man and the budget man and keep all the records and I'll be putting an agreement together not only a document saying what each person is going to do, but what our projected plan is. What parts of Atlanta will we go? What what price range will we be looking at? What's our projected profit? You know, I can't. I just can't imagine any any business book saying, okay, we'll just you know just talk about it and don't write up your business plan. What what business book says that? This is a business, so you you write up a projected plan as to how you and your partner are going to make money. And then at least you'll have it, you know, it's, it's more of a mindset. You have it visually right there written up as to what you're going to be doing. And then you focus on it. Okay. Thank you. There's a couple more questions, but I do want to reference. Um, if you're doing LLC uh, feature with your, um, within the, the self-directed account, um, you're using that LLC or checkbook control feature, uh, the operating agreement comes into play, whether it's a single member LLC that the IRA owns 100% or you actually are partnering with other investors, uh, the verbiage for the LLC, the operating agreement, Advanta or the IRA custodian actually signs on behalf of um, the IRA, but also too, it'll show that the IRA is actually um, the owner and not you. You can act as a manager, but it'll actually show, for example, Advanta IRA, FBO, which is for benefit of, and Jane Doe, account number 123 as the actual member of that LLC within the operating agreement document. Um, with IRAs or checkbook control, the operating agreement just lets the IRS know when this LLC goes out and buy 123 Main Street, don't come after me to tax me personally. This is owned by my IRA. It's tax sheltered. So I just wanted to um, interject and provide that. Another question that came in is, uh, I think earlier you mentioned um, limiting the partners to maybe two or three. Is there a specific reason, meaning um, why limit to only two or three partners? I mean, you don't have to. I would just say, you know, once you get past a total of three partners, you know, you're going to have a lot of different minds. Now, it depends on how you set it up. I mean, if if the three partners or partnership, uh, what I call profitable partners, like they're going to get a certain percentage of, of the profit, and maybe the fourth person is not going to, you know, get a percentage. Maybe they're just going to get paid a certain amount. I mean, if you're, if you're really going to scale up and the, the – you know, the biggest scale up I've ever heard of, and just because, you know, I talk to, to you know, the great thing about doing loans, I, I get calls for everything, gas station loans, nursery loans, fix and flips, of course, number one call, cash out refinances. But I, you know, and I do train people to do to do my job, do the loans, because the loans is probably the best way to, to learn you know, real estate, you, you're, you're going to learn so much from your clients. Why did they go to this part of Atlanta? How much do they think they're going to make? They'll tell you everything. Plus you're going to see their budget. We, we, we have to have the budget on your renovation line item by line item. So, you know, you're going to learn so much, but no, I mean, you, you could have more than three people. I just think, you know, at some point, if you're all profitable partners and you get too, too much, you know, too much, uh, you know, feedback from each person and, and, you know, it, it could backfire is, is, is my assumption, but there's no, you know, there's no nothing in concrete. You can set it up with five partners if you wish. I just, what, when, when I think about partners, if something comes up and one of us doesn't agree with it and they, they give a reason, then I'm, I'm pretty much always going to listen to my partners. I, I like a unanimous decision. So me, Renika and Joe all, uh, say that this is good and we will move forward. But if one of us says it's not good and we can bypass that step, then I will probably do it. There, there's so, usually going to be some reason and as long as they can explain it, then even if one of us says don't do it, then I would say don't do it. 
Understood. Um, if there's any additional questions, uh, feel free to put those in the question box. Again, Farley, I appreciate you um, presenting today. Let me just pull back up my slides um, so I can share. If you have questions relating to self-direction, uh, again, feel free to reach out to me. Go to advantaira.com or you can you know, send me an email or give me a call. Also, Farley's um, contact information is on, um, on the screen, so you can reach out to him, whether it's via call or visit his website at um, topoptioncapital.com or send him an email. Um, any last parting words before we um, end this webinar, uh, Farley? I appreciate everybody's time. Like I said, there, there's always a partner out there for you. And the great thing about real estate, you know, we're, we're not we're not starting a McDonald's together. We're just going to do one house. Let's let's see how we can work together. It doesn't mean that you know we have to continue to do deals together. But let's see how we do on the first deal, and we will find out. You know, with, with a house, I mean, if you're doing it right, you, the, the turnaround should be, if it's not too big of a renovation, should be about three or four months. A restaurant, I mean, most restaurants probably take one to three years to really find out where they're heading, and that's a long, a long road. And some of them lose money right, you know, from the first year. Some of the biggest restaurants in Atlanta you know, lost money the first two years, but then they made money. But that's a long road. Why not partner up in real estate and find out very quickly if you can partner up and do business together? It, it can really work. Uh, wonderful. Again, thank you, Farley, for being our, our speaker today. Again, this will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel uh, later today or first thing tomorrow. Uh, with that, happy investing, everyone. Thank you so much.